we view a scene through the eyes of the killer. Are you aware that the Bramford had rather an unpleasant reputation around the turn of the century? Now, in the traditional horror movie, we often saw things from the victim's point of view, but that's no longer. Now we look through the killer's eyes. Awful things happen in every apartment house. Uh, this house has a high incident on unpleasant happenings. This is for you from Roman and me. Just a little present is all for moving in. We have to make a baby. You all right? I have a pain. Where? Here. It's almost as if the audience is being asked to identify with the attackers in these movies, and that really bothers me. You're inside me getting tighter and tighter. Sleep is what you need. Good night's sleep. Where's the baby? Where is it? We're your friends, Rosemary. I don't believe you. You're lying. I mean, that, was, that was the whole nature of the film, was, was that we didn't want it to have any of those kind of big tricks. When, when the executives from 20th Century Fox came over and we were filming the, uh, the dining scene, um, I don't think I've ever seen people look more shocked in my life at what we were actually doing, because when we were setting the whole dining scene up, I, I just became aware of the fact that, that actually Magenta wasn't a very good maid and, and Riff Raff certainly wasn't a very good butler. And, and they wouldn't know. They, they'd think, oh, people have lots of forks, you know, people have lots of knives. And so the whole idea of that came from them thinking they knew what to do, but in fact they didn't know what to do at all. And they were wonderfully incompetent. Sure, it was great when it all began. <laughs> <laughs> but it's even better now. Yeah. Yeah. The taking off of the house was actually, we started building a full uh, model of the house. Um, it was going to be much, like, really big. And fine, we ran out of money and we couldn't do it. And then someone said, look, just, we'll just do it by cutting a cardboard cutout. And that's what it was. It was just a cardboard cutout, a photo of the house, right, in front of the house. It just got, if you look at it very cl 
closely, you can see quite clearly the house is still in the background. You know, in New York City, this thing wouldn't have gone anywhere. You know, and that kind of love and dedication, and, uh, and he made it, and he made it, and it's still here 40 years later. I think that there is a, an element in that film of a kind of elaborate, I mean, it's, it's a, it, in one sense it, it has a cartoon element to it, but also, it, or comic strip perhaps more appropriately, uh, element to it, but it also has an element of a home movie. And uh, I think that, uh, you know, I think that some of the best films uh, may be technically quite flawed, but they have something of the kind of uh, edge and kind of humanity of a, a, of a kind of, uh, this is kind of a, a, a home movie for fairly extraordinary people. Well, I'm a little embarrassed now because I've got a surprise for you. Oh, God. Well, between the three of us, we have slept with to Pan Am. Actually, between is, is two. It's about three. <laughs> <laughs> Room for one more? Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. And I don't sleep with people. Oh. Oh. Yes, Janet. Ralph's a lucky guy. Yes. Vivian Westwood, who was absolutely not famous at all. She had a little shop at, in the world's end. And it, at one point, it, she changed the name all the time, but it was called Sex. And I, I was rather aware from her. And I would write, in those days we didn't use cash, we used checks, and I'd write the check out to sex. Yeah. pounds. And when I met with my accountant, he went, Nell, you are spending way too much on sex. <laughs> someone who played an important role in your past? Yes! Your past is going to come rushing back. <laughs> I hope I remember. What was his name? Who? Wait! I can explain. I'm telling you, if you do, if, if you do a, a 50th anniversary, I'll be there. But I swam it, Janet. The future is ours, so let's plan it, Janet. So please, don't tell me to can it, Janet. I've one thing to say, and that's. I've done the interviews with them, and I, I'm totally blank. I've got nothing. I, it's... It was high as a kite the entire time. The way that Frank had worked it out was that um, you just had to create a rainbow, and that's how he created the uh, built the creature. And that was the um, you know the scene where he's adjusting all the um, all the colours. That was to form a, a kind of perfect spectrum in the uh, in the tank. And in fact, on the day that we were shooting that, um, I had just no idea what the colours were. So I had to um, stand there and yell out to Timmy the colours. And if you if you watch the way that Tim Curry fumbles around to get those those knobs, that was because um, he didn't know where they were. <laughs> we tricked him. And that's go see the man who began it. Janet. When we met in his science exam it. Janet. In the house proper, and we built the elevator in um, 
in the sort of stairwell area. Janet, I love you. Janet. It fit every uh, cliche in the book about every B movie. And I think even unbeknown to people who haven't even seen those B movies, it clicks as a cliche thing. I would like, uh, if I may, to take you on a strange journey. People. There may well have been other actors that auditioned initially for uh, the role of Frank. Uh, I can't remember them. I just remember that Tim Curry walked in the door of the Royal Court Theatre saying, rip it up and got the role. He ripped it up. I made you, and I can break you just as easily. We'd all grown up with a kind of culture of late night movies and this musical kind of encapsulated that but of course it also uh, underneath that surface which was uh, you know slightly cartoonish and sexy and enjoyable. Rocky Horror's cultural impact may not so easily be quantified. Midnight Screen started in New York City, soon spread around the country and became the biggest where attendees would get free of admission if they arrived in costume. Here's uh, the longest running movie in motion picture history. For five weeks, and the, with a budget of £2,000, and um, the rest is history. We ran in London, we transferred twice, we ran in London for seven years. I took the part because Mary Ann Faithful was on a trip uh, with her guru in India, so I got the part instead of her. A friend of mine was cast in the uh, show that the theatre company in LA. Uh, who can say? I didn't even think it was going to last um, five weeks. Well, I thought we'd run for five weeks with the, with the stage play, but uh, that was it as far as I knew. in LA. So I had met Tim and I knew Tim. And I, my dad was a big band singer and I had always been told that I couldn't sing. And I had such a phobia about even humming out loud. Did they do this to you? And for some reason every time I went up for a, a stage thing in New York they would ask you to sing Oklahoma and nothing would come out. <laughs> and so I and I, and I thought, this is such, so much ego. You know, everybody should be comfortable. It doesn't mean you sing great, but you should be able to. I mean, singing is kind of part of being human, right? Or I mean, excited mental state. It is also a powerful and irrational master. I was scheduled to do a different movie, and I went by just to say hi to Tim. And they were casting the film. Tell, Tell us about, about it, Janet. Janet. <laughs> they, they really only had two parts that were available because everybody else was doing the other parts, and that was Barry Bosworth's part of my, and what ended up being my part. And I was feeling done in. Couldn't win. And they had always had people that could sing that part really well, but she was never funny. You mean she? Uh -huh. I thought there's no way. And they asked me to read, and I was like, well, I can't really sing. They said, all right, just read it. And, and she was kind of. It leads to trouble and seat wetting. Now all I want to know is how to go. I've tasted blood and I want more. More, more, more. Kind of bitchy thing. And uh, so they laughed and they said, oh, come on, you can sing this, can you sing Happy Birthday? And anyway, so they... Touch, 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 touch me. I want to be dirty. Go me, chill me, fulfill me. Reach your world tonight. They to do it. And I thought, okay, I'll get over my phobia about singing. I'll get to England. They'll give me alcohol and drugs and they'll figure out a way to get over this. It's a great rehearsal cost. And of course they didn't. Down, 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 down. And that's just one small fraction of the main attraction. You need a friendly hand, but I need action. And I had 
had to just kind of brave through it. And when it came out, because it was such a cheap film, I mean, not cheap, and expensive. Um, I wanna be dirty. <laughs> I don't think of it as cheap, but it was very shocking at the time, and so Fox never really released it. And two guys at Fox started giving it to, so it sat, it, it, it opened in LA and disappeared in two days. And it never went anywhere else. And then they started feeding it to art houses and gay cinemas and things like that. And I've got to keep control. I remember doing the time war, drinking those moments when the blackness would hit me. And the void would be horror picture show. The screen version of the Rocky Horror Show, which opened in the Royal Court in June 1973 and has now moved to the King's Road. The part of Frank Inferta in the original stage version and in the film was played by Tim Curry. It's just a jump to the left. With your hands on your hips. I was... Uh... Doing the play that was on before it, at the theatre upstairs at the court, uh, which was called Give the Gaffers Time to Love You, and was not a triumph. Um, it wasn't shown to the critics, in fact, because it got a bit kind of messed. And uh, they asked me to audition for the Rocky Horror Show, and I knew Richard O'Brien, who wrote everything, the book, the music, and the lyrics. No, not at all. In another dimension, with voyeuristic intent, so. Well secluded. Uh, the play was quite different from the movie. It was much more, it was very dynamic. And it was staged in, in, in London. Hello ghosts and goblins, friends and family. This is Mark Hazel. I know we do a morning report, but I felt it was very important for me to get on here and to tell you this. Be safe tonight. It's all Hallow's Eve and it's dangerous out there. Go out with family, go out with friends. It sounds silly, but use the buddy system. Don't go alone. Be safe. Nothing says date movie like a 3D ride to hell. until 2004 that we met again. Six actresses going to the same house to audition for the same part. <laughs> well, it sounds like a lot of fun if you like blood baths. That we both got to share our stories and she had no clue I had a stalker, so we kind of bonded over our misery of the aftermath of Friday the 13th and we became so close. Learn something about themselves. One of you is Audra. No, I am. Why have you brought those girls here? Is this your idea of a casting session? Are you going to play, Samantha? Have you ever wanted something so badly you would do anything for it? I'd kill for the power. It was wild. I, it really, it was the experience for me on the first one. What the hell are you up to, Samantha? Now well, all's fair in love and auditions. What makes you think you're right for Audra? I'm as right as anybody else you got here. Guess you gotta want it more than being loved. Are you enjoying yourself? 